Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This past week I was in my bedroom and Tootsie came in the room. And if you don't know who Tootsie is, don't worry. I'm faithful to my wife. Tootsie is Tootsie's a girl, but she's a, a girl dog, right? And she is a, she's been our pet for 10 years. And she came in and she went to, she's, she wanted to hop up onto the bed, which she's done over and over and over again. But this time she's measuring her steps and she jumped, got three-quarter way, back down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jumped, got three-quarter way. And I lifted her up and put her up there. Now, she was able to jump up last night. So maybe she was just having a bad day. But when we first saw Tootsie hop up onto our bed 10 years ago, we knew the day would come when she wouldn't be able to do it anymore. I don't know whether that day is getting close or not. She's still, got, she's still spry and all, but I don't know whether she's losing some of the spring, right? Tonight... At about uh, 6.40, at least that's when it's supposed to begin, right? There's going to be a 38-year-old man smashing his body into 300-pound people, right? James Harrison plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's, he is, the, the, the people refer to him as, as a beast, but just because somehow he has maintained these massive muscles and this, this daily routine he goes through, you do not read about a 38-year-old defensive linebacker that's, that's smashing into people like him. I know Tom Brady's older, but he doesn't get hit much, and the refs call everything that happens to him. But, <laughs> but for James Harrison, but he's not always going to be able to do that. But what, what can we count on to be there? Well, how about the sun? All right? If there's anything, it's the sun. But even that, we're being told by scientists, has got an end date on it. They're, they're estimating 5 billion years or whatever, which won't matter because I was reading an article the other day saying that, that you know, that, that at, at the maximum, no matter what we do, human life only has another 500 million years left on this planet, which I don't think, obviously, I believe the Lord's plan is different than that. But even the sun is going to come to an end. But there is a God who was and who is and who is to come. And He has promised He is faithful. He's faithful. I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now that's if you're going from Revelation, turn left a little bit. It doesn't take too long to get there. You go through James, Hebrews, going, that, that, going left. And you'll get to 2 Timothy. It's a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. It's obviously the second letter he wrote to him, which is why it's called 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, wonderful sonnet, if you want to say. I don't know if that's the right grammatical term. But just little poetic words that are used. We believe these are creeds. There's numerous creeds in the New Testament that we believe that the early church, remember their commitment to keeping accurate truth was they would often have songs that they would sing about Christ, you know, that he was crucified, risen, you know, and this is one we believe. That before that was ever written down, it was something that they sang to be true. It is a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Jesus said, if you deny Me and turn away, don't have faith in Me, you, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. But verse 13, if we are faithless, as His followers, if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. We're reading it, and in our minds, the way Paul's setting it up, if, if we are faithless, then he's going to be faithless. But Paul says, but, but that can't happen. Because he is a faithful God. His faithfulness shines when ours fails. And I really want us to be stunned in a fresh way by that today. Because we are not 
talking about the president of a company or the president of a country or the head of the United Nations or whatever. We are talking about the God of all creation, the God that every single human being, their lives are in his hands, that he has said something about himself. He remains faithful to his followers, to his children. Well, let's see how he is, his faithfulness shines when ours fails. Because Paul says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And let, just look at a couple examples that we sometimes scurry into, right? The first is this. When we choose self-interest, he remains faithful. Look if you went back to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. When we choose self-interest, he remains faithful. Judges chapter 13, we come across an individual, verse 24. Judges 13, 24. Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Manahan. You read that? I'm kidding. Like so, sometimes you read those terms, and you're you're like, and your eyes just skip right over them, and that's okay. Uh, But the Lord began to stir on him. God puts His hand on Samson and begins a work in him and through him. But just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and just like Vincent McDonald in Maple Shade, New Jersey, Samson decides, I am going to choose self-interest. I am going to choose to not be faithful to you, God. But rather, I am going to choose what I want in the moment. We read in chapter 14, verse 3, then... Uh, Well, chapter 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. The Jews were not supposed to be marrying them, right? Verse 2. So he came back, told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Verse 3. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father... Get her for me, for she looks good to me. Get her for me, because literally, she is right in my eyes. We read often in Scripture about the people who did what? They did right, what was right in their own eyes. Even here, in in Judges, we read it. Doing right in their own eyes. She is right in my eyes. I decided that... It can't be wrong if it feels so right. She lights up my eyes. I want her, right? And so Samson says, get her for me. And that choice becomes a pattern in his life that eventually leads to Delilah. And we turn to Judges chapter 16. And in Judges chapter 16 and verse 4, after this it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. He gets... Self-interest after Delilah. And what does that lead to? Because the Philistines are trying to kill him, kill him, kill him. And God keeps using it to, to bring about his justice. And Samson keeps wiping them out. But it eventually leads to what? In verse uh, 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all that was in his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all that is in his heart. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. And she made him sleep on her knees, called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. And then she began to afflict him and his strength left him. She said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains, and he was a grinder in the prison. They thought, we don't want to kill him, we want to make him suffer. 
you know, we, we see this event, and those of you who, if, you know, uh, are old enough to remember Tom Jones singing, right? Why, 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 Delilah, right? But really the song should be, why, 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 Samson? Forget about Delilah. Samson, why? But we know the answer. We know the answer. The answer is that our sin nature is driven by self-interest. And our sin nature, driven by self-interest, leads us into sin's snares. Our daughter Deanna, our middle child, is I think she's serving in, in the nursery or children's church this morning. Um, when she was a little one, just going about on her you know, knees and hands, um, I was the pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Cherry Hill, and the parsonage there, or a set of steps going upstairs, and one day we were in the house, and we just heard... And we ran around there, and there's Deanna kind of laying against the wall, you know. So if there's anything you don't like about Deanna, it might have happened that day when she <laughs> hit her head on the steps or whatever. So it's our fault. Don't blame her. But um, uh, seriously, though, she, there she is, and you're like, oh, my goodness, and she was okay. So I took our piano bench, and I sat it by the step. And I'm obviously seeing it more from my, you know, height perspective, but piano, and there's a step there, and then the piano bench, and... A little while later, we hear, and she had gotten between the step and the piano bench and up and all the way down the step she went, right? So I took the hamper and I sat the hamper under the piano bench, took Vincent's hockey stick and slid it across, then took several of his plastic swords and put them down in between. We didn't hear the sound. What we did hear is this. And we went around to the stairs, and there's Deanna caught in between. She was like an animal in a thicket. Right? She, she was caught, and half her body had gotten through, and, and there was a sword, I think, that jammed in like her, her, like, her pants or whatever. And she couldn't get through, right? Sin does that to us. Sin takes us into the snare. Self-interest. Here's the direction I'm going to go. And that's why the Apostle Paul says to the Romans... The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free? And this body of sin. And maybe this week you were feeling that. Maybe you are feeling it. I told the Lord I would never do that again. And yet, look where I've gone. How can I possibly? I've told, I made him promises. This is the seventh time I have to go back to him. Can I? And here's what's amazing. You can. Because He's a faithful God, even when we are faithless. He is a faithful God. Look, if you would, at Judges chapter 14 again in verse 4. What did we read there? However, when His dad's saying, you don't want to go after those women, Judges 14, 4, His father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for He was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now, it wasn't saying that God was sending Samson into sin. What he's saying is that God was a faithful God who has started a work in Samson's life, and God is going to stay committed to his work. Paul says, I'm convinced of this very thing. He who began a good work in you, he will perfect it. And it results in what? It results in chapter 16 uh, when Samson, with his eyes gouged out. Now, listen, God remains faithful. But you may experience some consequences because you chose self-interest. I I say, Lord, right now, I just want a million dollars or whatever, and I'm going to go into corruption or whatever. I, I may have to live with the consequences of that. He's still faithful. As a faithful God, He allows me to face the consequences of my sin. But He doesn't. Leave us. Look at chapter 16, as I said, in Judges and verse 28. Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And we know what happened. They were having fun teasing him. He's chained to some posts. They're mocking him. And God stays faithful 
and gives Samson renewed strength and he pulls the posts and the whole place comes down on them. See, when I choose self-interest, God remains faithful. God remains faithful. I say, Lord, I forgot all about you. Do you remember me? Yes, he does. He hasn't forgotten about you. Samson says, Lord, please remember. And he does. He never forgets. He never forgets. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten what he promised you as his child, that no one will ever be able to pluck you out of my hand. Not even yourself when you choose self-interest as his child. There's a second picture I want to give you, and it's this. When we sink into self-pity, he remains faithful. When we sink into self-pity, he remains faithful. You already may be thinking of an example of that, but it's in 1 Kings chapter 18, the man being Elijah. For in 1 Kings chapter 18, we have this powerful passage there of what is happening. Elijah has stood up in the strength of the Lord against 450 prophets of Baal. They made their offering to Baal. He has his to Jehovah God. He tells them, do whatever you want. And they're crying out to Baal. And they believe, oh, we'll, we'll get Baal to respond. They start cutting themselves. Look how, look how much we're sacrificing you for, for you, O oh, Baal. God doesn't, the true God doesn't want you cutting your arm to, to show him you know, who you really, how much you really love him. No, nothing happens. And Elijah says, pour, pour water on my offering. Go ahead. Pour water on it, put a moat around it, fill it up, soak the thing. And Elijah says, Lord, and the offering gets burned up. Incredible response for in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 39 we read, When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Then we go over to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Ahab is king, Jezebel is queen. They uh, led the people into worship of Baal. So therefore Jezebel is not happy that Elijah has killed all of her prophets, right? Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a message, messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he, that's Elijah, was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down on a, under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, out of context, that verse may be pretty powerful. Like, like Simeon in the New Testament. Lord... You have allowed me to see the birth of the Messiah. You can take my life now if you want. You, you, I, I have seen more than I deserve to see. But that's not what's being said here. This is Elijah saying, you might as well just kill me. Just end it. I don't want to be here anymore. It's self-pity. It's Elijah crying out in self-pity. How do we know? Well, look at his words in verse 10. He said to God, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Verse 14, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. Same words. It's, it's his message. It's the storyline he's developed. And as human beings, we can develop storylines, can't we? And a lot of people get used to hearing it. We don't understand how I was treated when I was younger. And you may have been treated terribly. And absolutely, th there's a reality to that of hurt and wounds and brokenness. But it's not the storyline that's yours for the rest of your life. 
once Jesus steps in, a difference begins to happen. Because now you're being treated by the faithful God, right? But we can develop storylines and we rehearse them in our mind. We don't understand why. I, I don't get involved in church ministry anymore because 14 years ago when I... 14 years ago? Well, well, yeah, it was at a different church. It was at a different church. Or it may have been here. Or it may have been me. I may have failed you. I may have done something that, you, that I was wrong. Don't let that become part of your storyline for why you'll never serve the Lord again because Vince McDonald failed you. He hasn't failed you. And, and, and what his storyline, and it begins to come out, and it begins to cry it out. Why is he acting this way? Hold your place there, because James tells you why he's acting this way. If you look all the way over in the New Testament to James chapter 5, James tells us exactly why he's acting this way. For in James chapter 5 and verse 17, James tells us, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's why he was acting that way. (laughs) Literally, the verse there literally saying, Elijah was subject to the same feelings we're subject to. Why is Elijah having a pity party? Because Elijah's like me. And Elijah's like you. And sometimes we fall into self-pity. One minute we're praising. The next minute we're pouting. I can think of, I remember sometimes my dad would be working late when we were kids and my mom would kind of come in and say to the six of us kids, you know, I think I've, I, I, I've kind of gone through some change and uh, I think I have enough money, you know, we're going to order some McDonald's for dinner. Remember? And, Teresa and, I, and she would. We'd all get a cheeseburger or something, but she'd maybe get three orders of French fries. Right? Yay, we're having McDonald's. Yay. Can we get French fries too, Mom? Yes. Yay, yay. Oh, Mom, you're the best. Oh. And then she would divide the French fries and put them on your plate. Wait a minute. He got more than mine. And I can remember my mom saying, Vincent, I counted them out. He got seven and you got seven. Yeah, but his are those nice long straight ones from the middle of the potato. I got some of those ones on the, you know, with the curve that, you know, they're a little, you know, I, you know. Lord, I know that I deserve to be in hell forever and I need to deserve to suffer for my sins and I know that and that you've taken me from hell forever and you've given me eternal life in heaven forever and I know that I don't deserve to have food and shelter and clothing and you've provided all that for me and I know that I don't deserve to have people in my life that love me but you've given me all that but why did you let me have a flat tire? That's Right? But, but that's us. And we fall into self-pity. Look at them and look what they have. Look at what God's making me go through. Self-pity. There's real details. Absolutely. He's on a mountaintop. It's an incredible moment. He's going to come down. He actually runs like 17 miles ahead of the chariot. It's amazing stuff. He's physically tired. But oh, wow, look how God cares for us when we're not faithful. You look at verse 5 of chapter 19. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. God gave him faithful care by letting him go to sleep. See, sometimes you're saying, Lord, I need a verse. Give me a verse. You don't need a verse. You need to go to sleep. Because <laughs> you're still a human being. And you're exhausted. And your nervous system and your emotional system is empty. And yes, God can supernaturally move over you. But one of the things He's given you is sleep. Go to bed. Then come back for the counseling session. You know, Go to sleep. He gives him that. Not only that, what did you have to eat? Well, I had a Hershey's bar. What did you have before that? Well, I... I uh, I took some no-dos to stay away. What would you have before that? Well, I drank a Coke. Go drink some water. And you flush your system, right? What does he do next? He feeds him. Arise and eat. Verse 6, he looked and behold, there was at his head a bread cake. Cake is good, right? We just read it there. <laughs> Baked on hot stones and a jar of water he ate and drank. Look how God is caring for him. 
Then in verses 12 and 13, God takes him through different things to do what? To show him his presence. God's in the voice that comes. I'm here with you. Verse 18, what does the Lord say to him? Listen to me. I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I'm all by myself. God says, oh, you, you disgust me. <laughs> no. I'm faithful. And I'm going to give you rest because you need rest. And I'm going to give you food. And I'm going to show you that even though you want to die, I'm still here with you. And I'm also going to tell you, you're not alone. There's 7,000 other people that have been faithful to me too. You're not alone. Scott Wesley Brown sang a song that I loved years ago. You're not the lone ranger. Don't listen to the devil's lies. You're not the lone ranger, so go ahead and cry your eyes. Jesus walked this earth and he's been right where you are. You are not alone. You're not the lone ranger anymore, right? But the ministry that God gives, he's faithful. There's a, there's a third and last thing here. When we choose self-interest, he remains faithful. When we sink into self-pity, He remains faithful. When we trust self-power, He remains faithful. In Matthew chapter 26, there in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Jesus is speaking to them. He's about to go to the cross, be arrested. We read in Matthew 26, 31, Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. I'm going to be there waiting for you. What does Jesus say? You are going to be unfaithful to me. I've officiated a lot of weddings standing right here and other places. And I often, after the vows have been shared and the rings have been shared, just before you may, you know, you know, kiss your bride and all, I, I remind them, hey, now let's remember what you just joined to here. You didn't make vows that say, as long as you are treating me absolutely perfect that day, I will love you. I say to them, listen, let's remember, she is not going to be a perfect wife. She's going to have bad days. He is not going to be a perfect husband. Know that going in, right? Because it's going to call something from you. Jesus says up front, you will not be faithful to me. He looks them in the eyes and tells them that. And what do they say? Oh, you don't know how strong I am. Verse 33, Peter said to him, even though all may fail away, fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And don't miss the last sentence there. All the disciples said the same thing too. It's always Peter that gets, yeah, Peter denied the Lord. Peter says what? I will not, and I can tell you I'm stronger than you think I am, Jesus. You just wait and see. I am stronger. You're going to be saying to me later, I was wrong about you, Peter. You really were stronger than I thought you were. And all the other, can you see all the other disciples? Yeah, us too. Us too. Yeah, us, he's not any better. Us too. Bring it on. All right. Whew. And they do. And they all, we read, what do we read just a little bit later? Verse 56. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Jesus is arrested. And then all the disciples left him and fled. All of them. And then Peter's in the spotlight where he says, I don't know him. What are you talking about? I don't know him. So much that he starts cursing. I don't know him. But what did Jesus say in verse 32? And I hope these words minister to your heart. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. When you realize that you have failed me, you won't have to come looking for me. Because I'll be there for you. Whew. Now that has made whew, all the difference for me at times. 
when I stop and say, oh, Lord. But I don't have to go looking for him because he has come for me. He's faithful. He doesn't leave. I know I shared this with you years ago, and it's not, it's, this is not about me as a dad. It literally just gave me a little taste of how weak I am as a dad and how amazing he is as a dad. For Natalie was probably 11 years old, 12 years old. I don't have the years right, but she was a goalie in the Saleo Soccer League. And the gymnasium was filled. And they had gotten to that tournament day, and they had gotten down to the last two teams. And Natalie was in goal for her team. And I could see her swallow again. And in that Saleo League, when it goes into overtime, each minute they take players off. And it came down to one player in front of Natalie and Natalie in the goal and one player on the other team. And, and there was a shot that was going up into the left corner. And I saw Natalie reached and saved it. And I saw her even look at me and go, oh, oh. and I realized, you know what? I had better be prepared for what might happen. And I made my way down the stands and I stood just a couple of feet out of her sight line just waiting for just in case she doesn't make the save. And a shot came, and the ball went flying into the net, and Natalie dropped to the ground in tears of failure. And I was, by the time she hit the ground, I was sweeping her up in my arms, carrying her off the court, kind of, right? Like, it's okay, you did great, right? But I thought about myself, as, 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 as weak as a dad as I am, I had positioned myself to be there for her when she failed. What a father we have. He says, even when you fail, I'm going to be there. And he was. He was. And there he enters into the room where all the disciples are hidden and afraid. And he says, peace, peace be unto you. I told you I would be here for you even when you fail me. And he said to Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Even when you fail me, I am faithful. I'm faithful. And there may be something that you can't verbalize. You don't have to verbalize it to me. Whatever it is, if you're his child, he has not walked away from you. When we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he can't deny himself. Isaiah chapter 43, we're told, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. In Matthew 28, I will be with you even to the end of the age. In Hebrews chapter 13, I will never leave you or forsake you. In John chapter 14, I will not leave you as orphans. He has been, he is, and he always will be faithful. What have you done? Where have you traveled? He has been, he is, and he always will be faithful to you.